In this video, we're going to discuss bulk mass transfers of gases in the form of diffusion and effusion. This figure on this slide shows you a picture of what gas diffusion looks like, the bulk motion of a gas from one container to another or through space. Imagine we had two different gases, H2, the white circles, and O2, the red circles, in two separate containers linked via a closed stopcock. When we open the stopcock, you probably have a good sense of what's going to happen. Red gas particles will move in a net sense into the left container, and white gas particles will move in a net sense into the right container until we reach a situation at equilibrium that will remain that way for all time unless we do something, where the concentrations, numbers of moles of gas in both containers are equal. So the number of moles of hydrogen on the left equals the number of moles of hydrogen on the right, and the same is true of the oxygen. This is diffusion. The red and white gases diffuse into one another so that they end up equal in concentration in both containers. Gases do this on their own spontaneously. They expand to fill the volume accessible to them. And they do this because on the submicroscopic level, if we look at what gas molecules are doing, they are moving at rapid speed, mostly through open space, and occasionally colliding with one another. To begin thinking through that model of gas, and we'll take a much more detailed look at that model in a future video, but to begin looking at it, we can ask about the distance over which a gas particle travels before it runs into another gas particle and, and collides with another gas particle. This is what's known as the mean free path. And essentially, the longer this is, the faster diffusion is, since the gas molecules can cover more distance before they collide with something, be it another molecule or the container wall. So mean free path gives us a sense of the speed of diffusion of the gas. It can be related to the kinetic energy and the speeds of the particles themselves. And it's an important variable for beginning to visualize the submicroscopic model of gases. And it's an interesting one to explore in a quantitative sense. For a gas that's contained in a liter container, how far does a particle travel before it hits another particle or the wall? That's an interesting question that I'll leave you to ponder, but calculating mean free path gives us a sense of the distances involved in gaseous phases. Now, effusion is a completely different ball game. Terms are similar, but the sense of the motion and the experimental setup is very different. Effusion refers to the escape of gas molecules through a tiny hole into vacuum or a much, much lower pressure, where vacuum here implies zero pressure. So while diffusion is the motion of gas particles, say, inside the container, if I poke a little hole in, say, a partition in the container and I allow particles to move through that hole, that's known as effusion. You can think about it like poking a tiny hole in, balloon, in a balloon as gas particles move from the inside to the outside of the balloon, they do so via effusion. So here, for example, we can see the purple molecules effusing through the tiny hole. They started out exclusively in the left-hand container. Moving through that tiny hole to the right-hand container is what we call effusion. It's kind of a restricted mass transfer through a tiny hole. The rate of effusion is described by Graham's law, which essentially relates the rate of effusion to the molar mass of the gas. Qualitatively speaking, the heavier the gas, the slower the effusion. And we will develop a molecular model to understand and explain and prove Graham's law here shortly. So the heavier the gas, the slower the effusion is kind of the intuition you should have. And mathematically, the rate of effusion is proportional to one over the square root of the molar mass of the gas. If you think through this, heavier gases will have a larger molar mass, so the square root of the molar mass will be larger, and thus they'll effuse more slowly. We can think about Graham's law in a relative sense by setting up a ratio of two rates of effusion, and this is usually more useful since the proportionality doesn't tell us a ton. We're interested in the relative rates of effusion. So for example, for two gases A and B, the relative rate of effusion of A with respect to B is the square root of the molar mass of B in the numerator divided by A in the denominator. And that's key, one over the square root of molar mass, right? So watch out for these symbols. The molar mass of A shows up in the denominator since its rate is in the numerator, and the molar mass of B shows up in the numerator because its rate is in the denominator on the left-hand side.
As a simple experimental demonstration of effusion, imagine we started with two balloons containing helium and argon, and we poked a tiny hole in each of them, allowing the gases to effuse out. Helium is lighter than argon. It has a smaller molar mass than argon, and so the gas effuses faster out of the helium balloon than the argon balloon, and this is a direct consequence of Graham's law, and we could quantify that relative rate of effusion using the molar masses of helium and argon, which we could just pull right off the periodic table. This is a practice problem related to Graham's law and effusion. It takes 243 seconds for this quantity of xenon to effuse through a tiny hole. Under the same conditions and with the same number of moles, what we want to know is how long will it take a sample of neon to effuse. So one thing about rate and time is worth pointing out here, right? Since we're given times, how does time relate to rate? Well, time is proportional to the reciprocal of rate. Rate is a number of events per time, per second, for example, right? So time is proportional to one over the rate. This means that the time to effuse is proportional to the square root of the molar mass, one over the one over the square root of molar mass, if you like. So the time required for the neon to effuse divided by the time required for the xenon to effuse is equal to the square root of the molar mass of the neon divided by the molar mass of the xenon. Another way to think about this is one over the square root of the molar mass of xenon divided by the molar mass of neon. However you want to think about it mathematically, it's going to be equivalent to this. We can plug in those molar masses of neon and xenon from the periodic table, and we get a relative time of effusion of 0.392. So it takes about 39% of this 243 seconds for the neon to effuse, is one way to think about this. And so setting that up, we can say that the time for neon to effuse is 0.392 times the time for xenon to effuse. Plug in the given time for xenon, 243 seconds, and we get 95.3 seconds. Now this, as in many cases in chemistry where we're comparing two numbers, is a good point to pause and take a sanity check, thinking about the model of effusion in the underlying submicroscopic picture and whether our number is consistent with that. 95.3 seconds is less time, faster rate of effusion than 243 seconds. And this makes sense if we think through the relative molar masses of xenon and neon. Neon is lighter, and so its time to effuse should be shorter than that of xenon, and indeed, that's what our calculation is suggesting. 